the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Father, we also want to thank you for the burdens, the beautiful burdens that you've given us. Because without a test, Father, we have no testimony at all. We thank you this morning for everything that's going on in our lives. We thank you for things being as well as they are. They could be better, but Father, we also know they could be worse. We thank you, Father, for everything. We thank you for this opportunity to assemble once again in the house of prayer. We ask that as we go through this day, that something will be said that will carry us along through the week. We pray for those that are in the hospitals, nursing homes, other treatment facilities, Father. We pray that you will continue to be with them, heal them according to thy will. We pray for those bereaved families, Father. Send them a comforter that will be with them in the hours and days and the months as they go through the loss of a loved one. We pray that you would just comfort them in ways that, that only you can, Father. Father, when it's all said and done, we ask these and all other blessings in our son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Deacon Belser, for getting us started with the word of prayer. And we hope that was felt in each and everyone's heart as we began. Uh, today is interesting. It's, a, it's actually a new book, a new lesson, a new everything. And you know, whenever we get new books, I always get distracted from studying the lesson as to studying the structure of the book. So, so, but I won't bore you with the structure of the book and words from the editor and all of that stuff, but I find it interesting because they're people, I'm a person, and it's better when I feel like I have some insight to them. So, unit one, Jesus teaches about faith. That's what we'll be studying for this next, for the entire unit. And our subject today is no worries. Um, just a wonderful subject because it's just so easy to worry. You know, I was worried about coming up here and, and talking to you guys and, and this word right here just reinforces, put those worries away. Our devotional reading this morning comes from Ezekiel, the 34th chapter, verses 11 through 16 and is as follows. For thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and search them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountain of Israel by the rivers and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pastures and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their foes be. Shall they lie in a good fold, and in the pastures shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. Israel. I will feed my flocks, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. So Ezekiel went kind of deep on us on that one. But he went so deep to let us know we don't have to worry about a thing don't have to worry about a thing. And it's a very appropriate um, devotional reading for what our subject matter is. Our subject matter is coming from, our parent passage is coming from Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 25 through 34. Our key verse for today, the key verse, your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all things 
But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. NIV version says, the Heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seeks first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So, Matthew, you know, I, I, I like to talk a little bit about the person we, we are speaking about. And Matthew is attributed to writing the story of Matthew. One of the things about Matthew, Matthew is said to be the first of the disciples to actually put his gospel in writing. So he was kind of a first guy. You know, and what's interesting about this, if you kind of been with us over the last several quarters, we've been talking from the Old Testament and just going down through those things. But now we move over to Matthew. So the Messiah has come. And it's interesting because if we read the beginnings of Matthew, then we find the story of the Messiah. And by the time we get to chapter five of Matthew, he's ready to preach the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> but that's not what our lesson is about today. That's just setting us up to see where we are, where we're coming from in today's lesson. So as I said, and, and we're coming out of chapter six, but in chapter five, there are some things that are given to us that we're all familiar with. We call it the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in the spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. And we know they go on. So he tells us there about all of the blessings. He's actually giving us a guide to life. If we have those attitudes about us as we go out into the world, then all else is added unto us. But when we get over here to our biblical analysis, this is chapter six, now we get a different kind of tone that is reaffirming who we are, what we are, and how to deal with things as they come to us so that we stay within the beatitude. There are things that can draw us out of that. Bills, worries about the houses, our homes, worried about our family members. There are just things that can draw our health, our clothes, things of this world, those temporal things those things can tend to draw us out and interfere with us being able to keep the Beatitudes and being long-suffering and, and forgiving and loving. So today we're gonna to look at our biblical analysis and it's gonna kinda of tell us how to go about keeping the Beatitudes. The analysis of the biblical text, why worry about cares, do seek, comes from Matthew 6, verses 25 through 27. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life, what ye shall eat of what ye shall drink, nor yet your body, what ye shall put on. It is, is not life more than meat, and the body than raiment. Behold the fowl of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather unto bonds, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by, t by taking thought, can add one cubic to your statue? So, so Matthew comes right out, right out the gate here. And he's telling us, put these worries aside. Put these worries aside. See, when we start worrying, we take our focus off our salvation of where we are trying to go to. He gives us proof. We serve a creator that created the heaven and the earth, everything in it, under it, and upon it. More importantly, he created us. 
So who are we to worry if we keep the Beatitudes and love one another and care for each other? then all the rest will be added unto us. We have to care for each other. And that message is just repeated and repeated, and I know you heard me say it a thousand times, but it is what it is. So let's move on to the second part of the lesson or the biblical analysis. The second part is verses 28 through 30. Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not he much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So, O ye of little faith. Matthew is a human being. So he's dealing with these things just as we are. But now he's passed on, he's seen. But here we are, we're still, we're trotting through. Things are approaching us. Things are making us sometimes weary in our, our faith. You know, let, let, me, let me put it real for you one time. So, you know, you, you, um, you're trying to get somewhere on vacation or whatever, or work maybe, and you're driving along and somebody cuts you off. And you say, man, that dude almost made me lose my religion. <laughs> you know, we are people. He ain't gonna make you lose your religion. He just was gonna make you say some bad words that you probably shouldn't say or get into some comments you probably shouldn't get into. But he doesn't make you lose your religion. But those are the types of attacks that if they keep occurring, we have that near miss on the way home. We get home, turn on the light, the light don't come on. We, we try to use the telephone, it ain't quite working. Okay, I look at my wallet, I didn't get money out the bank, I go to the bank and, and I, I stick my ATM card in there and I don't get no money out the bank. See, all of this stuff starts happening and we start losing faith, focus on where we're really going. Where we're really going. Because see, there are a lot of ATMs all over town, you can just go to the next one. Believe it or not, that light, the fact that your light may not have come on, it could have just be the default GFI switch that the circuit breaker popped. In the near miss, maybe just was God's getting your attention. We got to have a positive outlook. We got to have the Beatitudes. And why? Because we cannot be consumed with worry. So we move on to the last part of our analysis. It says, um, why worry about consumption? Do submit. And it's verses um, 31 through 34. And it's as follows. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or whether shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought of the morrow. The morrow shall make thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So NIV up for that verse 34. <clears throat> Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble 
of its own. We're just not supposed to worry. We're not supposed to worry like that. That worrying can really, it can cause you to literally become ill. And when something is bothering you that much, take it to your Savior. You will be surprised. By the time you bend your knees, your blessing, you can feel your blessing on the way. I mean, just when you say, God, I can't take it no more. I done worried about this. And before you get here, you can feel the power of the Savior. And then you just get down and say, what's on your mind? He already knows. He already knows. You know, and I love Matthew. Uh, one of the things that I noticed here in Matthew that I think is very important about this transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Here in chapter 6 and verse 32, it says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth they, they yet have need of these things. So that Gentile seeks. You know, I'm always on the lookout for that Gentile word. Because if we're not very careful, we forget what our inheritance is in our salvation. That we are a part of the promise. So here you would read that and it almost comes off negative. But we must understand that here in the New Testament, Jesus now comes and makes a way for the Gentiles. It's at this point where it becomes clear. We, we understand that Abraham went back and he circumcised all his helpers and everyone, everybody. But you know, sometimes we can get a little consumed, especially after God has chosen his people and told us who his chosen people are, who he has set out there for an example for us. We can get so overwrought with the example that we forget about who we are. So after Peter visited Cornelius and he went back to tell them who they were, and they was, you know, bucking, you know how you do when you get back to those important meetings. Those guys, the big guys are sitting there saying, we're going to chastise them when they get back. But he said to them, who am I to go against God? We need to know who we are. Lord knows this is good news. Lord knows I would like for each and every one of us, I would like for our, the world to go about this next week following the Beatitudes. Go back, read over them, and just adhere to those because you will find so much peace and you'll be able to put that worry away. So, again, Sunday school is so strange to me because Sunday school is supposed to be interactive and I'm here talking to you. <laughs> is there anyone that would like to say anything? Yes, sir.
Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Let me see if I get this right. Is it the Honorable Mr. Deathridge? David. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome to our Sunday school class and thank you so much for your input. Is there any, anybody else? So I'm going to close today with the prayer from the book as we try to follow what we've learned. Let us pray. Lord, Help us to set aside our worries and exchange it for worship. Guide us by your spirit every step of our journey and every moment of our day. Teach us to trust your, you always in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the fellowship of our faith, in the name of him whose love has no limits, whose grace knows no measure, whose powers have no boundaries uh, that are known unto men. It is out of his infinite riches in Christ Jesus that he gives and gives and gives again. Good morning, y'all. Oh, you could do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, all week long, um, many of us have had to go um, through one degree of grace to another. Uh, many of us have had to come through uh, many heart trials just to make it here today. Um, sometimes um, we look around and a smiling face might hide an otherwise aching heart. So whenever we come together in God's presence, we ought to come with an attitude of gratitude, just being grateful that God has brought us this far on the way. Can you say amen? amen. I thank God that we're allowed to um, move our services a little bit. As you know, we're moving towards um, fully reopening uh, in the month of August. So this is dress rehearsal getting us ready. Good morning, Sister Kirkpatrick. Amen. So happy to see you this morning. You too, Brother Kirkpatrick, but really, good morning, Sister Kirkpatrick. <laughs> so wonderful to see each of you today, um, my brothers and sisters. And I don't want to preach long, but I do want to preach strong. I want to say a word or two about Jesus uh, this morning. Amen? Amen. And um, if you have your Bibles in just a moment, I'll be asking you to find the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 5, a very familiar passage of scripture. Amen. Won't you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you. Lord, you brought us all the way. Lord, we thank you that you have been our friend who has stuck by us closer than any brother. We thank you that you have been a doctor in some sick rooms. You've been a counselor who would not rest the case until the work is finished. Now, God, as we stand before you, we ask that you send those two darling angels, grace and mercy, to accompany us uh, in this service and throughout our lives. God, we lift up that person right now, that soul that is near as hell, that young person standing at the crossroads of confusion, not knowing which way to go. Father, that mother, uh, that father, uh, that son, that daughter, that person in need of a mighty touch. Oh God, we know that uh, with one touch, dungeons will shake, chains will fall off. Uh, those who are captive will be set free. Just one touch and the doctor's diagnosis will change. Just one touch, weeping eyes will dry. So God, we pray now that you will stretch forth your hand of mercy and touch from the least to the greatest. Oh God, touch us in our weakest points Touch our minds, touch our hearts, touch our souls. Sanctify our work, ordain it with success. God, we lift up those who are suffering uh, the loss of a loved one. We know, oh God, that when the sun sets on this side, it's only to rise on a more distant shore. Give them the confidence and the peace in knowing that life and death are nothing more than twins who work in the kingdom of God. For the end of one is truly the beginning of the other. And so, God, I pray now for the waiting congregation that you would infuse us with a glimpse of your glory, that I might say a word or two in the name of Jesus and for the great glory of God. And that, Lord, if there's anything I have failed to ask, please don't fail to grant. In your wonderful name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Touch. Touch me, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
with the hand of mercy mm, make each throbbing heartbeat feel thy power divine oh take I will doubt thee never, oh, cleanse, cleanse me, dear Savior, mm, me holy thine. Y'all remember that old song? As way back then. Look at the reading of this text, beginning with verse 1. From the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, a very familiar passage of Scripture. Here now the reading from this text, verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. That's the opposite side of Galilee. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tomb. A man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him no not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was up in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Verse eight, for he said unto him, come out of the man thou unclean spirit and he asked him what is thy name and answered saying my name is legion for we are many and he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country now there was there nigh unto the mountains a group of swine feeding and all the devils besought him saying send us into the swine that we may enter into them and forthwith Jesus gave them leave and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea they were about two thousand and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine for a living and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had just taken place. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind they were afraid our celebration text again verse 15 and they come to Jesus and see him that was before possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind 
and they were afraid. You know, my brothers and sisters, um, many years ago, that was the testimony in many churches. If you think back, and, and they would say it so fast that I really didn't quite understand what it is that they were saying. Um, they would get up and say, I thank God that I'm saved and I'm sanctified and full of the Holy Ghost and I was closed in my right mind. They would say that part so fast that I started imitating them and then people would say, how you doing? And I would say, I'm closed in my right mind. They didn't quite know what it meant and one of my brothers didn't quite know what it meant either because he and my, one of my sisters had an argument one day and he said to her, he said, if you don't be quiet, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. My mother said, hold it, wait a minute, you don't have much. So you can't afford to give away a piece of your mind. You know, the mind is um, very key um, to the human life. And uh, mental illness, my brothers and sisters, is a very real and a very sometimes complex phenomena taking place in the life of the church. Now, this is a difficult message, but it's a very real and frank conversation. Um, I'm told that about 40% of all the veterans who have served this country faithfully and honorably and who are homeless and living out on the streets suffer from some form of mental illness. I also understand that uh, between the ages of 18 and 21 is when the manifestations of mental illness begin to show up in the lives of young people. And so a very critical problem has taken place in the life of the Christian church, and that is we oftentimes misdiagnose what we see and attribute it to something else. So on these precious few moments that are yours and mine to share, I want to lift up in your hearing the message, things are not as they seem. Can you say amen? Things are not um, as they see. My friends, if you look at this text, a number of interesting things are taking place. We find that there is this man who is living out in the tombs. And so just to set the context, in those days, the tombs is where they often went to bury their dead. And um, the tombs was also seen, the cemetery, as an unclean place, you know. No clean person would be found there. As a matter of fact, the rabbi would dare enter there because it was assumed that had he come into contact uh, with something that was unclean, he himself would become defiled. And it's kind of interesting that this man um, who, now the scripture does not tell us why, but this man is living on the outskirts of town. And he's living out in a place that is reserved for the dead. And in my own mind, I can imagine life must have become unbearable. Life must have become overwhelming. Life must have seemed unfair when you would rather live in the place of the dead than to live amongst the living. Uh, life must have seemed so crushing and debilitating to him that he found more confidence and solace and peace living in a cemetery. Has anybody uh, ever experienced uh, those situations, not in your life, but in the life of those you know and love? when they have seemed so overwhelmed, so crushed, that they simply wanted to get away. Now, this is a hard text, but you might as well say amen. Uh, they have found that uh, the tools at their disposal were inadequate to sufficiently meet their needs. And when you get to that place, one of three things will take place. When you, when you get to a place where everything you know to do does not work, that which you have been led and instructed to rely on is unreliable. You will either keep trying with little success, you will stay there and do nothing, or you'll try something else. And so here this man is, and he's living out amongst the tombs, and we don't get any indication from the text um, other than the fact that he was possessed with an evil spirit. And my friends, the first thing I want to tell you is we must be careful that we don't spiritualize human conditions. Let me say it again. We got to be careful that we don't spiritualize human conditions. I'm reminded of a situation growing up where there was a woman who got up in the choir stand and she began to lead. She was leading the song. She often led songs. And she got up, lead the song that day and forgot all the words. And she stopped and said, the devil just stole my words. My mother tapped me and said, no, she just didn't practice. Sometimes we can spiritualize human situations will not get us to a confident resolution. There's nothing worse than putting a spiritual context on things that are very human. Someone loses a loved one and we go to them and the first thing we say is, don't cry, Jesus will. 
Uh, somebody lose a loved one, the first thing we say is, you're supposed to rejoice when they're going out. No, God understands that we are flesh and blood and also spirit. And God understands that there are things that will pierce us to our heart and all it takes is the tools that he's already given us. This man is living amongst the tombs and society would rather not deal with him so they cast him away, spiritualize his condition and say he has the devil in him. I don't know exactly what it is that caused him to live out there but I imagine that he must have found himself in an unfair social, political and economic arrangement such as he would rather live among the dead. Now if you look at the text, the Bible says clearly that Jesus is going in the direction of the Gadarenes, which means he's coming from Galilee. He just performed miraculous and wonderful work there. He wasn't even destined to go that way. Uh, but he happens to go that way. And as he's going that way, the man notices Jesus. And uh, Jesus notices him. And the Bible says that when the man saw Jesus and Jesus saw the man, one of the first things the Lord does is the Lord asks him, what is your name? Now, something interesting takes place here because it is important, as I said to you last week, uh, it is important uh, that we know the Lord, but it's also important that the Lord knows us. And Jesus asks him a very profound question. He says, what is thy name? And you notice what takes place, don't you? The man does not answer. Do y'all see that? He's having a holy conversation with the master healer. Jesus asked him, what is your name? And the, and the demons, the legions, the spirits answer for him and say, we are many, we are legion. The Roman legion consisted of about 10,000 soldiers. So we are many. My friends, we gotta be careful that we don't allow our problems to speak for us. Have you ever noticed a situation where we fail to see people as people, but rather we're looking at the problem? A person who's wrestling with an addiction, a person who's wrestling with mental illness, they are more than the problem. They're just a person with a manifestation of the problem. Oh, this is going to be a hard message, I can tell. Uh, and so when we see the problem, rather than the person, we dehumanize them and we prevent them from getting to a place of healing. If you ever want to help somebody in need, treat the person and not merely the disease. Because we are people of mind, body, and spirit. If you see me drowning in a well, I don't want you to go somewhere and hold a prayer meeting. Can you say amen? amen? If I'm starving and I need a piece of bread, don't tell me you're going to keep me in prayer. I know that. If you see me and I'm in trouble, don't just tell me about Jesus saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want you to do the spiritual thing, but also do the very human and practical thing. This man is living out there among the tombs, and Jesus wants to know, who are you? Uh, you're not who I made you to be. You're not where I want you to be. You're not living up to your potential. But the man had been in that condition for so long, he allowed his problems to speak on his behalf. I don't know about you, but the first step to healing and restoration is when you decide to speak for yourself. Can you say amen? I might not be what I wanna be, I might not be all that I could be. I thank God I'm not what I used to be. And if you really want to see what I could be, let me get up from here. I've been here too long. I've outgrown the spot. I don't even think like that anymore. I don't even act like that anymore. I don't even look like that anymore. If you really want to see me rise, start looking at me as a person and not as a problem. He lived in the tombs because society had deemed him a problem. I'm not talking about Anderson or Atlanta or Birmingham, uh, but there are some places where we would rather incarcerate the person than treat the person. The Bible says he was often found with chains on his hands and his feet. In other words, 
you had a man who suffered with an illness but was being treated as a criminal oh lord there is no indication in the text that he had broken any laws there is no indication in the text that he had not offended the system the only thing that we know is something wasn't right with him and that society decided that the best way to treat somebody who has become a problem is to incarcerate them not only was he incarcerated, bound with chains, but he was also run out of town. Now, if you've never been run out of something, you're not going to catch this point right here. If you've always been accepted and always been welcomed, then you, you sit tight. I'll get back to you in a second. But if you've ever been chased away, if you've ever been minimized, if you've ever been dehumanized, if you've ever been underestimated, if you've ever been misdiagnosed, then you can sympathize with this brother because what he had going on is not what they were penalizing him for. They were penalizing him because he had become a problem. He was a problem because he did not look like he fit in. He didn't seem normal. Uh, he, he dressed funny. He, now he's, he's not dressed at all. He, he acted different. He, he didn't stand at the appropriate times. He, he didn't sit in the correct place. He, he seemed as if he didn't fit in. And so their response was to incarcerate him and drive him away. I'm trying to tell the church right now that the church can never be the church until it begins to see people in the eyes of God and not merely as a problem. Maybe they don't look like you. Maybe they're not the same color as you. Maybe they're not as learned as you, as much money as you. Maybe they don't speak proper English. But God has not called us to be many judges. God has caused us to reclaim those who are lost. And this man is outside of the city. And now that he's there, Jesus asked him, what is your name? His problem begins to speak for him. And look at what his problem said. We are legion. There are a lot of us. Uh, over 10,000 of us. And uh, what he's really, <laughs> I think what the gospel writer is really trying to indicate is right here, Jeffrey, he doesn't have a single problem. These legions each represented a different problem. But the problem became a problem for him because he accepted, internalized, and acted upon the thoughts of others. They said he was crazy. They said he was possessed. They said he didn't fit in. They said he didn't act normal. So he moved out into the tombs based off of what they said. And because they said it, he began to internalize it and act it out. He took his clothes off. He began to play the part of the script that was handed to him. It is a dangerous thing when we act the part of a script written by somebody else. And so he never answers. Instead, his problems, his problems, problems were saying is that there are 10,000 of us and each of us represent one of the failures of Roman society. It could have been an economic failure. It could have been a political failure. It could have been a social failure. Maybe they didn't diagnose me properly. Maybe there wasn't a correct healthcare system. I don't know. But at any rate, he had 10,000 problems all inside of him. And the Bible says he was bound both day and night. This man, this man must have been a real problem for them. And notice what he says to the master. He says, Jesus, thou son of David, son of the most high God, what have I to do with thee? In other words, what do I have to do with you? And what do you have to do with me? But what he says next is very interesting because it indicates to me a tremendous failure of the religious leaders at that time and perhaps many in the church today, he asked him, do not torment me. Do not persecute me. Now, why would he say this of Jesus? In Greek, he refers to him as a rabbi. In other words, he's saying great teacher, a great leader, 
son of God, don't torment me. I wrestled with that to try to understand why would he say that? And then I began to, I began to comprehend that he knew who Jesus was. There's a difference between knowing the Lord and knowing about the Lord. He knew about him, but he did not intimately know him, but he knew enough to know he represented the church. Come on, help me preach, y'all. And so he says to him, don't you persecute me because I have been chased out of town by people who represent the church. Oh, come on, don't y'all see that there? He recognized Jesus as a leader of the church and he says, don't persecute me because it's been some of your same followers who misdiagnosed me. The reason I'm hungry, Jesus, is because some of the people in your church wouldn't give me bread to eat. Yeah, the reason I'm out here living in the tombs is because people who said they represent you and what you represent declared me to be a problem. That is the critical challenge of the church. That is to not add pain to the burden and the problems that people are already facing. If we can't make it better, leave it alone. He says, I adjure you, I plead with you, I beg you, don't make matters worse for me. I have been persecuted in the name of the church. I've been lied on by people who said they love you. I've been locked out and left aside by people who call themselves Christians. What do I have to do with you, Jesus? This is a searing indictment against the church. How to let the world see Jesus in you. And notice he says, I adjure you, don't persecute me by God, in the name of God. That's two ways to look at that. On the one hand, you can see him saying, I plead with you in the name of God, don't persecute me. Another way is don't persecute me in God's name. Have you ever known people who can do all kinds of horrible things in the name of God? Hmm? It's almost like, let me hate you in God's name. I'm going to lock you out because you're not saved. You can't come over here because you don't have the Holy Ghost. Uh, we don't want to deal with you because of your race. We can't allow you to be elevated because of your gender. People use the name of God and everything holy to justify ungodly and unholy things. And the man is standing there before the master. And Jesus inquires to know his name. His problems begin to speak. The man begins to plead. But notice what happens. The demons, the legions, begin to plead with Jesus. Do y'all see that there? The legions first, they recognize who Jesus is. I want to tell somebody here, there is no devil in hell. There is no sickness in laboratory. There is no leader in power who can do anything except bow down at the awesome power, the awe-inspiring, the wonder-working, the thought-provoking, the life-changing, the soul-saving power of God. These demons recognize that they were standing in the presence of the chief among spirits. Notice that they begin to have a conversation with Jesus. They recognize that he's no ordinary rabbi. He's no ordinary teacher. There's something about this man, Jesus. They, they began to tremble at his very presence. Now, the man had not yet changed, but he had come to a recognition that he too was in, this, in the presence of greatness. And the demons begin to recognize who Jesus is and what he could do. And they begin to try to negotiate and say, don't just send us away. At least let us go somewhere. Let us go into something. And so they get into a herd of pigs. The Bible says swine, you know. They get into a herd of pigs. And the pigs run down into the water because in those days they believed that there were several things that can destroy an evil spirit. One of them was water, the other of course was fire. And so he ran down into the lake and they tried to drown, but the story doesn't end there. There were a group of men who were standing by and saw the same thing. There were a group of men who had witnessed the entire interaction. Up until this point, they had done nothing. 
Up until this point, they had said nothing. They saw the man's condition. They saw his problem. They saw him as a problem, but they did nothing. I want to caution you, my friends. There are people sometimes in our circle and in our vicinity who know the problem, who know our struggle, who know our burdens, but don't you dare count on them to make matters better. They will sit back, watch, and enjoy the show. These men sat there, they saw all that had happened, but they did get upset. And the reason they got upset is not because of anything good having taken place or anything bad. They got upset because they saw the man as having contributed to their economic loss. They had made their livelihood of herding pigs. Now that the pigs had gone into the water, they did not see a man who had just been rescued. They saw money that they stood to lose. Not necessarily our society, but there are people who only see you as the potential to make a book. There are people who maximize by exploiting you in an economic way. There are people who contribute to your demise in order to get rich. I wish somebody would say amen right through here. Uh, there are people who profit off of your misery. And once they saw that their livelihood had gone down in the water, then they got upset. But ah, oh, thanks be to God. The story doesn't end there. Had it ended there, what I would have known is that a man met Jesus on the way. If the story ended there, what I would have come away with is that some men had lost their economic opportunity. Had the story ended there, what I would have come away with is that demons had been subjected to the power of God. But thanks be to God, something else takes place. These same men who stood by doing nothing, these same men who stood by saying nothing, the few disciples who was with him that day, the others haven't been in Galilee, they recognized something a little bit later. The same man who had been written off, who had been cast away, who had been locked down, the Bible says he was clothed and in his right mind. Now there's two things about that. He was clothed, meaning that he began to come to himself and understood that he had some dignity. If you ever want to see somebody soar and reach the gift that God has in them, help them get back to a place of being in their right mind. When he was living amongst the tombs, living amongst the dead, he acted that way. He thought that way. I dare you to tell somebody it's time to get up. Once you decide to get up and dress yourself and look the part and act the part and walk the part, God knows the same people who said you never amount to nothing will have to take note that you don't look the same. Your hands don't look the same. You don't even sound the same. You begin to tell people that was then and this is now. I don't know how you feel about it, but I have been at a place where I've been locked out, where I've been knocked out, where I've been held down, where I've been placed down, but thanks be to God, once I took enough sense to dust myself off, to roll up my sleeves, to put on my righteous clothes, to put on my breastplate of righteousness, to put on my helmet, to get my sword in my hand, I began to live like I was meant to live and you can't press me down, you can't lock me up, say I. He was clothed meaning he had put on everything he needed to get back to town but the story doesn't end there not only was he now dressed not only was he suitably situated for society but the bible says he was found in his right mind see when he was in his other mind he didn't know how to act he didn't know how to dress he didn't know how to behave. He even didn't think highly of himself. But oh, once he got his clothes on, once he got in his right mind, the Bible says the same people who looked at him, who laughed at him, who talked about him, who stood by, the Bible says they found him. He was clothed and in his right mind, they didn't get happy, they didn't rejoice, they didn't celebrate. The Bible says they were so afraid. I want to tell somebody here, if you want to see your enemies take flight and run, 
I dare you to get yourself up. I dare you to dust yourself off. I dare you to go ahead and open that business. Go ahead and buy that car. Go ahead and purchase that home. Go ahead and do the things that they said you couldn't do. And the same ones who said you will not amount to anything, the next time they see you, they'll have to say, surely he's been with you. It's closed. In his right mind, the people who saw it were so afraid. They should have been rejoicing. They should have been happy. They should have been thanking God that he was delivered. I want to conclude by telling you this. What they had seen as a burden for all those many years was just a blessing that God had not yet birthed into existence. There are people in our families, there are people in our lives, there are people in our homes, and we try to figure out what's wrong with them. I want to tell somebody, don't throw them away. I want to tell somebody, don't drive them out. I want to tell somebody, don't try to bind them up. There's a blessing somewhere deep down inside of them, and all they need is a close encounter with Jesus. Help me say yes. But you know my friends, the interesting thing about this brother. What I love about him so much is although he had been driven out in the tombs and although his friends had forsaken him, the text does not record one example of a visitation from one member of his family. You know what I love about him. Although he was in a place of death, he was in a place of economic deprivation, he was in a place of social marginalization, he was in a place of political isolation, he, he kept right on living. That's why he's around when Jesus is passing that way. I want to tell somebody here, you keep right on living. I don't care what they say. Keep right on living. It doesn't matter what they try to do to you. Keep right on living. It doesn't matter what the doctor says. You keep right on living. It doesn't matter what society says. You keep right on living. Sooner or later, sooner or later, it may be early. It may be noon. It may be late. But one of these old days, you will meet the master teacher. He'll meet you on the road of your own gatherings. He'll ask you for your name. He'll change things all around. And the next time you come to church, you'll be able to raise your hands and say, I've been through a lot, Pastor, but I'm just so glad to be in the presence of the Lord one more time. Is there anybody here who knows that things are not as they seem? Yes, you've been through a lot. Yes, the doctor walked away. Yes, your money went low. Yes, the family don't act right. But I come to tell somebody, things are not as they seem. The sun will shine again. Joy will return. Your strength will be renewed. Your faith will be confirmed. Hold on. Things are not as they seem. It's going to get better. It's going to get brighter. The Lord is going to be lighter. You will smile again. And the story, so it goes. This man, after he has an encounter with Jesus, is known all over the land. He has a way of turning things around and changing your name and giving you a new lease on life. Is there anybody here who knows that you sat in your own tombs long enough you'd abused yourself long enough you undressed your potential long enough you've been run out long enough people who said they loved you walked away are you ready to get up put your clothes back on 
dress yourself up dust yourself off and once you get your mind thank you Jesus thank you Jesus I might lose my sight one day I pray it never happens I might lose my ability to speak I don't want that to happen but oh God keep me in my right mind is there anybody here who want to be in your right mind because if I'm in my right mind I can praise like I ought to if I'm in my right mind I can serve like I ought to if I'm in my right mind I can worship like I ought to are you in your right mind you ought to thank God for keeping you in your right mind after all the hell you've been through after all the things you lost after all the times you were mistreated after all the lies were told you're still here you didn't give up you kept living and most of all you're in your right mind yeah <laughs> yeah I'm through y'all Thank you for my mind. Oh, glory. I thank God today. We've had enough to make us almost lose our mind. Oh, glory. A whole year of living through a pandemic. Look at us. We're still here. Yeah. Yeah. We're still here. They thought we'd give up by now. They ran us off by now. After that loved one died, they thought you were through. After you lost your job, they thought you'd lose your home. Yes. But you're still here. Keep on living. Keep on living. Keep on living. And when you go home, lay your hands on your own self and say, God, I just want to thank you for keeping me closed and in my right. Oh, Lord. I'm through, y'all. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Hey, I thank God for my mind, Dr. Collins. I thank him for my mind. Yes, yeah. A mind to do right. A mind to live right. A mind to walk right. A mind to love right. Is there anybody here who thank God you're in your right mind? Thank you, Jesus. I'm through y'all. He was clothed in his right mind. Not the mind they thought he had. Listen here. You are more than what they say. You are bigger than what's in the script. The story did not end when they drove him out. The story did not end when they bound him up. The story did not end when they held him down. Your story is not over until God says so. The story was just beginning because in a few days, Jesus was passing by. Oh, glory. I trust in God wherever I may be upon the land or on the rolling sea for come what may from day to day my heavenly father 
watches over me. I trust in God for in the lion's den on battlefield or in the prison pen through praise or blame through flood or flame my heavenly father watches over I trust in God. I know He cares for me. On mountain bleak or on the rolling sea, for what may from day to day my heavenly father watches over point at yourself Just give me one minute, I won't take long. Wherever I may be On mountain bleak Or on the rolling sea For come what may from day to day that's the consolation my heavenly father watches over my favorite verse and I'm I trust in God for in the lion's den on battlefield or in the prison pen through praise or blame through flood of flame my heavenly father watches over me the doors of the church open I trust in God, I know he cares for me on mountain bleak or on the rolling sea for come what may from day to day my heavenly father
the watches over me. I thank God for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Signs and wonders accompany his movement. Things are not as they seem. Life goes on. It's not over until God says so. No matter what limitations that are placed on us by others, whether they're interpersonal, you know, friends and family, or societal, no matter what the structures or limitations, you and I, through the power of the Holy Ghost, like the man in the text, can break every fetter hallelujah and live free the doors of the church open as where you may stand if you like as i extend an invitation to anyone who wishes to unite we'll do that then we'll do communion anyone who would like to unite uh can we do a little bit of my hope is built my hope is built on nothing less than jesus blood and righteousness i dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on jesus name on christ the solid rock I stand, all other hands seek a sand. Come on. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. And I dare not trust the sweetest but holy lean on, on Christ. Come on, church, come on. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is. Oh. Thank you, kindly. You may be seated. Let me get my mask. Let's prepare now for our communion. Mm. Huh. Mm. Oh, oh, let me finish. In every heart. We thank God for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In just a few weeks, hey man, we'll be moving back to our more normal setting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Down at the cross where my Savior, mm -hmm, down where from, from sin, sin I, oh, there to my was the blood. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, glory. Red to him, I'm singing glory. Oh, you know it. Come on, yes. Oh, precious name, singing glory. Red to his name. Oh, there to my heart, Lord, was the. Uh, Singing glory to just one more time. I'm singing glory to his precious name. Singing glory his name. Mm, there to 
my oh lord oh yes oh yes oh yes our father now in jesus name we thank you for this bread and for this wine oh god we pray know that you were consecrated by the power of grace divine we pray for everyone who will be partakers of this your most blessed body and blood will be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction oh god we pray now that you will move aside any sin any impediment anything that will cause us to eat and drink unworthy because in so doing we eat and drink damnation to our own souls not discerning the lord's body consecrate this bread this wine consecrate us that we may partake of this most blessed communion who in the same night O god in which you were betrayed you took the bread and after you given thanks you break it and gave to the fellow suppers and said this is my body uh, which is given for you for the remission of sin and you told us to eat likewise that same night after supper you took that cup and after you'd given thanks and blessed it you gave to each one of them saying this is the blood of the new testament which was shed for you and for many for the remission of sin and you you said that in as much as we eat this bread and drink this wine we continue a perpetual memory of your death and suffering lord we thank you for your death we thank you for your burial we thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for your ascension. And most graciously, we thank you for your second coming. May we be found ready when you return. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Won't it be grand? Oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Oh, won't it be grand? I'm going home to live with Jesus, won't it? Oh, won't it be grand? Oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? I'm going home to live with Jesus. Oh, won't it be grand? Oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Oh, won't it be grand? I'm going home to live with Jesus, won't it? One of these mornings, it won't be long. You'll look for me and I'll be gone. I'm going home to live with Jesus, won't it be? Oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Oh, won't it be grand? I'm going home to live with Jesus. Oh, Jordan River, chilly and cold, chilled my body, but not my soul. I'm going home to live with Jesus. Won't it be, oh, won't it be grand, oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand, oh Lord, won't it be grand? I'm going home to live with Jesus. Well, there ain't but one thing I done wrong. I stayed in sin a little too long. I'm going home to live with Jesus. Won't it? Oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? I'm going home to live with Jesus. Well, if my mother should look for me till her death set me free, and I'm going home to live with Jesus, won't it? Oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? I'm going home. To live with my Jesus. When I was growing up, there was a man at our church, Superintendent William Byrd, and this was his song, Dr. Collins. Nobody could sing it but him. I had to, you can stay right there. 
I had to wait till I graduated from college and came home to visit one Christmas before they allowed me to try to sing it. I did the best I could, and when it was over, at the church he met me and he said, now Jeffrey, that's my song. He says, a thousand songs. So now that I'm here and he's not here, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Oh, won't it be grand? I'm going home, live with Jesus. Oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Oh, won't it? Oh, Lord, I'm going home, live with Jesus. Here you go, Deke. Ah, Jordan River, chilly and Come on, Deke. Chill my body, but not, oh Lord, I'm going home. Here you go. Believe it. Yes, sir. Oh, won't it be grand? Here you go. Oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? I'm going home to live with Jesus. Oh, won't it be grand? Jordan River, chilly and cold. Chill my body, but not my soul. I'm going home to live with Jesus. Oh, won't it be grand? Oh, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? I'm going home to live with Jesus. Oh, won't it be grand? Jordan River, chilly and cold. Chill my body, but not my soul. I'm going home. Oh, yes, sir. Mm, won't it be grand? Won't it be grand? Oh, Lord. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain free. Stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross. In the cross. Be my glory is until my church soul shall rest be the reed. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and that they give him thanks and blessed that he break it and gave to them, saying, This is my, my body given for you. Take and eat with thanksgiving in your heart, the body of Christ. Likewise, my friends, at the supper, he took the cup. They gave him thanks and blessed it. He gave it to each of his disciples and said, this is my blood, which was shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Take, my friends, and drink ye all of it, the blood of Christ. Here the 
cross near the cross be my glory ever mm, till my rapture Sister Makita, you can come now. Deacons, if y'all will, you can move down for once. Oh, let me find rest beyond the rim. Oh, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory. My raptures. When it's all over, we find rest. Oh Lord, yeah. Makita. Good morning. We have one announcement today. Mark your calendar to celebrate our 141st church anniversary on August 22nd, 2021, during our morning worship. 141st. This will be during our morning worship. More information will be coming soon. We are removing, rebuilding, and restoring our spiritual connections that is seeing us through. Thank you kindly. 141 years, a lot has gone on in 141 years. You wanna say that? Huh? Oh, Youth um, Scholarship Committee, they're gonna recognize our youth um, next Sunday during our service, during the context of our service. And I'll be sure to send out a text. I can tell Dr. Harrington and Deacon Harrington probably didn't get that text. And don't point at me. <laughs> they are never late for service. And they weren't late today. Um, um, I told you in the sermon about spiritualizing stuff, um, the devil got the text. You can, uh, <laughs> uh, but um, so just to be clear, when we moved our, our, our service time to 10 so that um, that would give us time to end the service and still post online by 11. So if there's any technological problems, we hope to catch it and still post at 11 for our folks who are at home. And that only works um, if I don't preach as long as I did today. And Sunday school starts at 9.30. Now we move back into, when we come back into full fellowship um, in August, we'll go back to our normal times of 9.30, um, Sunday school, and then our church service, 10.45 devotion, 11 o'clock worship service. So, but for the time being, we want to try to um, be able to end our session now so that we, we are recording and so that we will have a few minutes in case Deacon Glover and um, Tony, if there's any problems, they can catch it and still post at 11. Because some of our members who are not in person will text me and say, I didn't see the message posted today. And of course, that's my fault because we need to, I need to make sure that it gets posted on time. If all hearts and minds are clear, I want you to kindly stand as we get ready to go home. It's so good to see all of our folks here today. And um, see, so we won't do our normal fellowship, how we come around and shake hands. We won't do that this time. Um, but by August, we hope to be doing it. So y'all get fully vaccinated if you're not. Amen. I expect to spend eternity somewhere around the throne. Oh, somewhere around the throne. Mm, somewhere around the throne. I expect to spend eternity somewhere around the throne in that new Jerusalem. I will see my friends and loved ones 
somewhere around the throne oh somewhere around the throne oh, oh somewhere around the throne i will see my friends and loved ones somewhere around the throne in that new jerusalem last one i will see the lord i love so well somewhere around the throne oh somewhere around the throne jesus somewhere around the throne i will see the lord i love so well somewhere around the throne in that new jerusalem things are not as they seem and now my beloved friends unto the one who's able to keep each of you from falling into the deep nights of desolation and despair but is able rather to lift you high upon his mountains of peace be love and joy hope and happiness now and in that blessed eternal so shall it come and i heard the people of god witness by saying amen amen, amen. and amen see you next week Let me